about something. Okay, I'm talking about something which, on one hand, in my heart of hearts, I'm not terribly convinced of. Okay, I'm talking about uh, a scientific attempt, scientific attempts to understand literature. On the other hand, while in my heart of hearts, I'm not really convinced of. It's been an extraordinarily important and influential way of trying to understand literature, trying to do what it is we're here to do, to read, to think about literature. Okay? It's perfected through in all sorts of ways. So, roughly, my lecture is in three, three <coughs> chunks. Okay? The first chunk is some contextual background. <coughs> Okay, about why people thought this was important, uh, what it was they were trying to do. The second part concerns uh, the most important attempt to do this, the most important way of thinking about literature scientifically. And the third part concerns some of the uh, ramifications, some of the consequences for that, uh, mainly the form of analysis called narratology. So, why? What's the question? Structuralism and narratology. <coughs> Okay, so what? Well, one way of thinking about this is to think about different ways of explaining things. <coughs> to think about different ways of explaining things. Now, put like that, it sounds very vague and peculiar. Different ways of explaining things. What are you talking about? But we might say, very roughly, that there are two contrasting ways of explaining phenomena, that's the modern word for things, okay, in the world. Two ways of explaining literature, language, trees, frogs, okay. One is uh, what we might call historical, or if we're feeling the mood for jargon, diachronic. What does chronic mean? Very good. <coughs> your look at your chronometers, gentlemen. Okay? And what does dial mean? Uh, <coughs> what's dialogue? Log means words, dia means. Dual means across. So diachronic means across time. So historical <coughs> explanations. How, how was it we got okay. um, And these explanations, tradition, tend not to be what we recognise as scientific. They tend to be historical. If I ask you about your mini, how did you get your mini? You say, well, you know, I had this job in McDonald's and I saved up, and it's easy, and so I bought it. Historical. And in fact, in the humanities, those are the sort of stories we're more used to. But there's another form of uh, explaining things, explaining why things are, which is thought of as being more scientific or synchronic. What does that mean? Well, let's take an example of a frog <coughs> down on their pond on campus, I'm sure there are, or possibly in the winter there were lots of frogs. <coughs> Oh, geez, not my strong points. Um, I think there being two ways of looking at frogs. I might say, tell me about this frog. And you say, well, this frog comes from along the line of frogs. They've lived here in this pond since Thomas Holloway put it there in 18 something something. Thomas Holloway, famous Victorian, Victorian con man uh, and shyster. Uh, generally a bad man. I should say that. It's a lecture theatre. Um, he was imprisoned, of course, for stealing medicine and recipes, but there we are. Um, so that's one way to talk about the frog. Another way I'd say to talk about the frog, you might say, okay, here's this frog, I'm going to cut it up and find out about it, not about its history or its past, but how it works now as a frog. And cutting up this one particular frog will tell me about all frogs of that sort. Does that make sense to people? There are two different sorts of explanation. Why is this important? It's important 
talks I'm about to give you potted history of the study of language. Okay? Potted history of the study of language. Which is important because what we do, here we are, studying literature, okay, is intimately tied up with that history of the study of language. So, where, where, and where, and where? history of study of language come from? Well, it comes from magic. It comes from magic. It comes from magic because a simple question asked endlessly in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. In the Garden of Eden, what language did Adam and Eve speak? What language did Adam and Eve speak in the Garden of Eden? Why does this question matter? It matters because in the Christian Bible, uh, Adam and Eve were given power over all the animals over all the world. Power which lay in their names. So if you could find out what language Adam and Eve spoke, you would have this naming power over the world. So magicians, people who call magicians, spent their time studying language trying to, if you like, excavate through language back to the original language of the Garden of Eden. Okay? Digging up through Latin, through Greek, into Hebrew, okay, other different ancient languages, trying to find out uh, what spoke. So they would have that power. Now, this interesting life approach Produced all sorts of fantastic, amazing things. But as time went on, as the enlightenment happened, the enlightenment, the great flowering of reason, and thinking, and thoughts, and uh, what we now call human rights and so on, that went on in the uh, 18th century. If you have five minutes, 15 minutes, read Kant's very short essay, What is Enlightenment? Only five pages long. <clears throat> Make you better people if you read it. Okay, it's widely available in the library. Okay. Um, I distracted myself with the cat. The movement went from being about magic, being about a different and more worrying sort of magic. A magic of race and of nationalism. Long before genetics, people thought you could trace race, identity, back through language. Find languages of more, less purity. And you can trace languages like a, a family tree. The inventor of the word uh, Aryan was a man called Max Muller, uh, professor of philology at Boston University. <coughs> okay. Using it to coin a, a race of languages, basically, it's proto European languages, you know, from which uh, English and German and so on came. So language became uh, tied up with ideas of nationality, ideas of race, ideas of purity, ideas of power. And so the study of language, okay, was rather like telling the story of the frog. Okay, it was a historical, diachronic <coughs> study of where languages came from. And indeed, when English was founded at the University of Oxford in 1893, there was a huge brouhaha. Lots of people said, study English is just poems and novels, that all seems nonsense. And they said, okay, so we'll have this philological element, we'll have this rigorous study of language. Okay? People like Tolkien uh, believed that philology, the study of the history of language, was the core thing about English. Okay, now, into this history, into this strange mix of race, identity, and nationality um, came, slowly, slowly, the influence of science. Science is a fantastically, wonderfully good thing. Okay? Most of us here in this room, who are not the science, will be dead. Okay? And of course, when people say to you, what age would you like to be in? It was quite cool, those nights and stuff. You think to yourself, hmm, penicillin. Okay. Antibiotics, they're good. Oh yeah, and full antibiotics, not so good. <coughs> Everyone used to be drunk and in pain all the time. Uh, okay, so, just to be clear, I'm not saying science is bad. But 
science eventually percolated into <coughs> the study of language. And this is the key idea that underlies structuralism we we'll are talking about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. All right? That uh, language can be studied not historically, but scientifically. And this will lead us a bit later to <coughs> scientific attempts to understand literature. Idea. It was a key idea, really, that underlies structuralism, which is pretty much uh, based on uh, the work of a Swiss linguist called Ferdinand de Saussure, whose name you hear bands about. He died in 1916, and his book, which should be in mechanics, sorry everybody, A Course in General Linguistics, Okay, was put together by his uh, graduate students, if you like, put together his lecture notes and produced this book, which turned out to be very revolutionary. Now, when I read the course of general having heard it was terribly revolutionary and exciting, I was not bored. It turns out to be a course in general linguistics. Okay? But the interesting bits occurred and speckled throughout it and right at the beginning. Okay? And also it's ongoing people that it. Let me talk a bit about this idea. As I said, the first idea is that language could be studied scientifically. What does that mean? Maybe I should see if I want to see that. First, the first thing that scientists do is they set up their field of inquiry. This is what I'm going to explore. The limits, if you like, of what they're doing. So that's the first thing. Okay. The second, and in a way, this is his most radical intellectual step, to say this language should be studied synchronically in how it's used, not where it's come, not where it comes from. Not what it meant hundreds of years ago, not how the word uh, Aleph became the word oxen, or ox, or whatever linguists say, okay? But it has used in day to day use. Synchronic, not direct. The question then, he asked himself, is how am I going to study language scientifically? And he introduces these two words that are often banned about long and parole. Okay, one just means language, one just means word, parole. What he meant was this. Okay? When a scientist, when you, your biology, GCSE, cut up that frog, maybe you didn't. Okay? Let's imagine that. Okay? You cut up that frog. You weren't just cutting up that frog. Well, you were. You were cutting up that frog tell you about all frogs. Yes? Everyone clear about that? Okay. So Saussure said by analysing some bits of language, some parole, some words, we would find out about the rules of all language. Everyone happy with that idea? Can we do it again? Tell us what's important. By analysing one frog, we find out about all frogs and indeed nature. <coughs> By analysing uh, some words, you find out about all words. Because what Saussure wanted to know, just like scientists want to know the basic laws of the universe, biologists want to work out the basic laws of life, like that's not frogs. Okay? Linguistic science scientists want to know the basic laws of language and so of culture itself. By studying language scientifically. Okay? So his mission is to uncover the basic laws of language and by the basic laws of language, the basic laws of culture. So, so he's on quite a big mission. So the first thing, one of the first things he did was to offer a definition. Of what a piece of language was. Okay. 
Okay? Let's start with a piece of language. Let's take the word from. Let's be stuck with from. Sorry. Don't go to my mind. Okay? Take the word from. The word frog, that your eardrums hear me say now, frog, is a sign. It's a verbal sound in it. Way to the end. It's a sign that will just as surely as this is a sign. What's the sign mean? Okay? And the sign of the comes to two as two main two bits. One, okay? is the materialness of the sign, the signifier, the actual this. The other is the sign is what it means, the signified. Okay? It's very straightforward, really. You don't fuss about it. The signifier is the word written on the page, the red light, the traffic lights, and it's the sign too. Okay? The signified is what we were philosophers, and we could happily spend the next three years talking about this division, what it means, and so on. But we're not going to do that. Everyone happy with the class and the Yeah, okay. Now, here's the bit which, when I used to teach this, having learned it myself, at the knees of my great professor. Okay. Uh, I couldn't understand why it's back. Alright? This was a sewer set. And it was at the time revolutionary, and today it seems rather obvious. Okay? So sewer set, the link between the signifier from and the signified, the green thing with eyes that goes really good it, is completely arbitrary. There is no intrinsic link between a frog and the word frog, between a tree and the word tree, between justice and the word justice. The link is completely arbitrary. Okay? Why is it revolutionary? Why is it surprising? Because somehow people still had the idea that words and things were somehow magically or divinely interconnected. There was some essential dogginess about a dog. And if you knew what well, Adam Eve called Fido in the Garden of Eden. Okay, he's had power over it. So he says that's all the boss. It's really arbitrary between these two things. Okay? At this stage, somebody always says, okay, what about onomatopoeic words? Okay, so that's a great game. Does anyone know what dogs say in other languages? Dog so is anybody here who speaks a language other than English? Come on, open up. They say guagua in Spain. They say guagua in Spain. That's not the same as woof woof. And in Germany they go woof woof. <coughs> Any other offers? <coughs> Snowy in French goes pa pa. Okay. So even on a matter of on a few words, a word that makes these a word that sounds like what it's supposed to be, like BAM! Okay, or woof. Even on mass peak words vary from national language to national language. Okay? Because the link between the signifier and the signifier is arbitrary. Okay, normally there's more fun talking about it. I have a very secret belief, which I'll share with you today. Okay? which is completely untrue and probably a little bit uh, out of order, is that basically secretly all dogs speak English. If you're in France or Spain, dogs go gow, 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 and they say, sit, and they'll understand what you're saying. <coughs> but perhaps it's not true. Okay. <coughs> That's what to do So, having said these things, okay, having said these things, what other ideas do we generate? I'd like to turn your minds to Sue very briefly. I'd like to answer this question. I'd like to know what makes tall people tall? Any offers? What do you think makes tall people tall? My relationship's 
whole in one. Okay? What makes tall people tall is not genetics, eating steak, coming from Texas. What makes what makes they walk tall in Texas? Okay? What makes tall people tall is short people. Okay? Short people make tall people tall. Fat people make thin people thin. Uh, stupid people make clever people clever. Okay? Because what underlies the pseudo system is an understanding. If you think about how language actually works, it works not by some magical link between the word frog and the frog teeth, frog. Okay? But by relationships. Meaning, the meaning of words, what words mean, depends on other words. Meaning tall depends on short. Short people make tall people tall. Okay? Meaning of table depends on all the other words that aren't table. Meaning, meaning of words comes from their differences to other words. Meaning of words comes from their differences to other words. And some of these differences, I'm going to talk about this in a second so it's clear in your head, okay? Some of these differences, the most important ones, come from oppositions. The meaning of hot is defined by the meaning of cold. The meaning of male in our culture defined by the meaning of female, vice versa. Okay? The meaning of up defined by the meaning of down, the meaning of down defined by the meaning of up. Now, <coughs> let's just rewind quickly and go over that as a different sort of word. Okay? One thing to say is let this idea of meaning being relational uh, just sit in your heads for a bit and you can ponder it. <coughs> The thing that scientists do, how they make their huge amounts of money, which I was told is, okay, how they make their money is by saying interested in complicated ways things that we sort of know but have a cloudy understanding. So what scientists do is offer nicer, cleverer, and more detailed understandings of stuff we already sort of understand. We don't need to know the theory of gravity to know that things fall. But knowing the theory of gravity allows us to understand that. <coughs> Likewise, with the science of linguistics, the science of the basic laws of culture, <coughs> we all know, don't we? Okay? Cast your minds back one year and two weeks, okay? The living hell of this precious. <coughs> I know it's due to. All right. Now, I speak only for myself, but in fresh food, when I was a fresher, and I was a fresher four times. Okay? So I was quite experience. Uh, I, in my nasty way, was able to judge people by what clothes they were. Okay? I'm sure nobody else does that. Okay? So I'm just speaking for myself. That's an illustration. What was I actually doing when I judged who was cool and who wasn't cool? Okay, two terms, cool and not cool. What was I actually doing? I wasn't saying that particular stylish coat means you're cool. I was comparing differences in clothing. Yeah? What I was comparing, what I was, what, there's not some link between Prada shoes and coolness. There's only a relation between different sorts of shoes. Different sorts of signifiers, shoes, shirts, clothes, jackets, have different sorts of signifies what they actually mean. And that meaning relies on the differences between them. So when you say that person's got a cool jacket, or indeed that person has a cool jacket, you're making an act of comparison about the differences. You're doing it in the sign language of clothes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you can see, can't you, how for every precious week in the last hundred years, okay, the clothes have of course changed 
one day I'll tell you about the miraculous disappearance of corsets in 1909, but not today. Okay? Their clothes changed, but the idea that the clothes were different and the differences were important didn't change. Don't you imagine, 100 years ago, to this day, it has led to it. People looking at each other's clothes and thinking, well, it hurts very hell of a moment. Okay? So it's the differences in clothes. Okay, it's not the clothes, not some magic thing about clothes, it's the differences that make it important. Okay, and that's what Saussure was trying to get at, trying to get at the idea that meaning is relational, and it's the differences between things that create that meaning. Everyone happy with that so far? Okay. <coughs> Okay, 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you. Go on, talk, talk! <laughs>
think this advert advertising huge, great Chelsea tractor cars is not of interest to me. I haven't got 16 kids and sheep. I don't live in Chelsea, so you wouldn't pay attention to me. If you did have 16 kids and sheep, you would be paying attention to me. You know, don't you, adverts are aimed at you and what adverts are aimed at other people. Yes? Why? Because you're experts in semiotics, yes? Well, being experts in semiotics. Yeah, I was actually happy with Chelsea have like one kid on a huge tank that they drive down. Don't get me started. Uh, it's the rigid bumpers that we okay. Um, I'm completely sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Where was I? Uh, semiotics. Okay, yeah. So, we're all mm, fantastic at We can all read the signs really, really well. Okay? Everyone is judging you on your clothes, on what you're saying, on your choice of clothes, your choice of haircut. Okay? Whatever haircut you have, it's still a haircut. Likewise, whatever choice of writing style still a choice of writing style. Does that make sense? When I was a very small boy, I used to wonder what the right typeface was. What the proper typeface was. There are lots of different sorts of typefaces. Which is the right sort of typeface? Which is the one with the first one? The answer is, there is no first typeface. Meaning, meaning the typefaces is relation to each other. Yes? So my choice of Times New Roman for this is trying to tell you something. My choice of typeface will tell you that I'm rigorous, well organized, and clear. Or something like that. Okay? If I had great big bubbly 60s letters and telling you something else. So even your choice of typeface <coughs> is a semiotic choice that you read. Semiotic. And the most important, perhaps the most influential thinker of this is a man called Roland Barthes. French guy, uh, the important frivolous fact you need to know about Roland Barthes is he was killed by a laundry truck. Okay, ran him over after dinner with the President of France. Sad. Okay? Um, the important thing you need to know about Roland Barthes is semiotics. And his fantastic book uh, called Mythologies. Find it in the library. Mythologies is a collection of very short, four pages. Semiotic analyses of things like milk. Okay? Yeah, it sounds funny, doesn't it? Okay? Or toys. Now, I have enough to get out of quarter six, I will remember to bring a child's toy in. You can analyze it semiotically. Okay? I'm trying to think of another prop so you can to add to analyze semiotically. This is my horrid mobile phone, because I'm over 35, I hate. Okay? This mobile phone is a semiotic, it's full, it's a sign. It's not just a phone. It's also a camera. No, it's not just a phone. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a sign, it's a signifier. And from this phone, okay, you can tell all sorts of things about the owner of this telephone. So who is this cool black science fiction telephone being marketed to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, te it's technological. Okay, it's a gadget. It flips up and down. Okay, these are all, not just things it does, these are all signs. Yeah, it's also smooth. Okay, that also is a signal. Very good, okay? It's part of your, of your whole style album. So it's stylish. So this says about me that I'm stylish, smooth, okay? Okay, but can you see how everything is, is weighted semiotically? We weren't being filmed, I'd tell you a uh, slightly risque story, but I'm not going to say it. Okay. Um, about what happened some years ago. So, Roland Barthes' short essays. 
things like milk, things like steak. Okay, how nice is Send me some steak. <coughs> if you're in a restaurant and you order a steak, what's the sign? What's going on inside that? What's going on in semiotic by ordering the steak? Say again. You're hungry? Okay. What does the steak contrast with? Salad. Salad. Okay. Salad, steak. What else is those columns? Steak, salad. <coughs> Texas! Okay. Masculine steak, feminine salad. These are all these oppositions. Structure, how we think. No, okay. We're going to keep steak too, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Okay, steak, manly, hungry, d d d d d d d d d Tough. Okay, can you see these oppositions? So when you see something, you say, what does it contrast to? What's the sign opposing to? Okay? So for Roland Barthes, it's uh, the semiotics of um, milk and wine. <coughs> contrast. This is what he says about toys. Well, I should read from my notes. Uh, okay, I've got to go off, I guess. Another one of uh, Bart's examples is with James Bond. Okay, James Bond sitting by a desk. There are seven telephones on the desk. Okay, what's the meaning of the seven telephones? <coughs> Very good, uh, but no. Okay, that's sort of mystical, magical. <laughs> There's some innate connection with the seven of the telephones. The seven of double seven. He's a very busy and important man. Lots of telephones, very busy and important. Do you see that? Number seven doesn't matter. It could be eight, it could be nine, it could be four. It's the, it's the excess of telephones that is the sign of his importance. Okay, so what Bar offers in mythology and what semi magicians offer in general is a way of interrogating the audience. Okay? We all know that the clothes you wear tell things about you. Semiotics, as is a way of science, is a way of analysing that in detail. And here's an important thing, particularly for us in literature, giving us a vocabulary with which to do that. Giving us terms, giving us ideas with which to do that. And, very <coughs> obvious, giving us a vocabulary. <laughs> And it's helping us understand the basic laws of language and so of culture which underlie what we all do. Meaning comes from difference, meaning is relational. Okay? What are the basic laws of culture? And you will discover, you will discover, if you start doing semiotics enough, you'll come down again and again and again to these oppositions which I mentioned earlier. You'll come down again and again and again to finding that two or three sets of jargon phrase, binary oppositions, binary just means two, yeah. okay, keep structuring how we do our thinking. <coughs> Hot, cold, male, female, day, night, sun, moon. Okay. So much so that some thinkers have argued that these binary oppositions. Okay. The alliance of evil happens to the other people. Okay? You know what I mean? These oppositions, the axis of evil, sorry, sorry, the alliance of evil. Okay, these oppositions structure our thought. We <coughs> think constantly in these binary oppositions. Now, personally, I'm not so sure about that. Okay? But lots of thinkers that you're going to be reading are interested in and use this idea. And indeed, you'll find you use it yourself. Okay? Binary auditions, pop books, <coughs> working hard, not working hard. Okay? And you'll find enough semantics that these binary auditions keep occurring and reoccurring. Okay, seven minutes. And it's this sense of uncovering the basic laws of culture 
is the binary opposition is our thought. In the West, if you like to use the West as a shorthand, okay, which underlies a huge area in which Saussure's work is incredibly influential in uh, structuralism, okay, particularly in the discipline of anthropology. Anthropology is the imperial colonial discipline sending experts and people at faraway places to report back on those people. Why you can't let any of them do it, I don't know. Okay? They had to hack these days. In the old days, you could just go far from other places. A man called Claude Levi Strauss, a key structuralist anthropologist. Remember, cut up one frog to find out about all frogs. Okay? So by finding about, about some bits of culture, Levi Strauss thought you could find out about the shape of a whole culture. You could uncover its basic codes. If, as some people have suggested, the basic codes of Western discourse is this binary opposition, male, female, hot and cold, okay? You could say that the, um, by studying the, the codes of other cultures, the, the parole, the words, the cultural actions, you could uncover the basic laws of other cultures. <coughs> Again, this came down for uh, Strauss to often binary position oppositions. His most famous book is called The Raw and the Cooked. Okay, about the distinctions between how you if you like, to take it as one bit, the process of cooking and preparation, and see how that, those laws, reveal much deeper laws about a whole non-Western culture. Okay? So that's it. you see how influential the idea is, the idea of a bit of culture, take about the whole thing. In fact, it's an idea that we sort of take for granted. Oh, sorry? No. Uh, he works having six years, wrote about apologies, highly recommended. It's a really, really good read. Um, and one of the most interesting where it turns the semiotics, which looks like a sort of neutral way of looking at things, into a highly politicised way of understanding the world. But now, very quickly, I'm going to talk about uh, narratology. Now, this is a bit of a con trick, because narratology began in the 1920s in Russia, separate from Saussure, but when it became a powerful intellectual force, <coughs> 60s, really, okay. Uh, it took on a, lots of ideas from Saussure, so I'm about to get together. Okay? Uh, that is the and the morphology of fairy story. Morphology just means shape, more or less. Okay? So, if what we're doing is interrogating the audience, okay, let me tell you about my daughter's nap that we had to buy on holiday recently. Okay? On holiday recently, we could buy our normal uh, recycling, cool, non-waste nappies. We could buy some, and I blush to say it, Disney princesses nappies. Okay? Uh, and I feel it's a shame because all they have are pets. Right? So I feel it's a shame that my daughter coming to nursery with Disney princesses nappies, which have on the front of the nappy three Disney princesses. I'm coming up with one. Jasmine from Aladdin, okay, um, that from last year. Uh, and, I don't know, Disney Beauty from Cinderella. Cinderella, yeah, okay. <laughs> What's interesting about my daughter's nappies? Well, what's interesting is that everybody in this room knows that in those Disney fairy stories, those Disney princesses play the same role. <laughs> they are, if you like, the same component. Yeah? And the Prince Charming, or Aladdin, or whoever it might happen to be, is the same component of that fairy story. And if you replaced Sleeping Beauty with Jasmine in the Sleeping Beauty story, there wouldn't be much difference, would there? Okay? Everyone sort of knows that. And basically, that's what Prop did. He took lots and lots of fairy stories, boiled them down, their key components. Probably, I think I can't remember now how many key components Prop said there were. Okay, maybe 
he said there were 23. I've got 27. Yes. Seven. Okay, well, I had a very interesting conversation with a proper analyst some years ago, and he said they argued over whether there were seven or nine. Maybe it was 24. Or okay, but you can see what he's trying to do. I'm trying to bring every story down to its key components. Okay? The most powerful broadcaster of Vladimir Prop today is the authors. Where do we learn most about Vladimir Prop from today? Okay. Almost perfect. Hollywood. Okay. Hollywood. Hollywood films are composed 100% of <coughs> propian lines. Indeed, were we in script writing class now, we would be studying prop. Okay, to find out how villains and goodies and baddies all work together. Okay, you know as well as I do, it's not just Jasmine and Sleeping Beauty who are. Uh, it's also, I've come for any famous film stars because I never go to the movies anymore. But you can swap Keanu Reeves with Brad Pitt pretty easily, can't you? Okay, you know what I mean. Alright? Break it down to its key elements. Okay. So, this idea of breaking down to key elements and to uncovering the key codes led in the 60s, my last paragraph. To uh, various narratological analyses, not just analysing things by character, <coughs> breaking down texts, doesn't matter what text, it could be Terry Pratchett, it could be Proust, it could be Shakespeare, it could be Tom and Jerry, breaking them down to their um, integral parts, bits of character, bits of plots, here we get more complicated, bits of how. Time are used. Let's have time. Here's another one. Here's my favourite one. How a plot is focalised. How a plot is focalised. What does that mean? It means through whose eyes do you see what's going on? Yeah? Through whose eyes do you see what's going on? Sometimes it's an omniscient narrator. Sometimes First person narrator. Sometimes it's not just a narrator, but you're stuck with one character all the way through. Yeah? How, how a novel is focalised. And how it's focalised tells you a lot about it. its use of time. These are all, as it were, extensions of prop, extensions of sewer, taking bits of things and using them to analyse any text. By analysing any text, I'm covering not just that text, but the laws of all texts. Okay, so, two key words in narratology are Jerry's next book, Narrative Discourse, okay, with the introduction and conclusion, and Schlomit, Grimm, and Keenan's book. Uh, Narrative fiction, contemporary poetics, which, as I say, is one of the most boring books ever written. Okay? But by the end, you will know everything you will ever need to know about narratology. Not very long, but it's quite hard going. Well, nice. Okay, so, just recap very quickly. I talked to you about science, what it was trying to do. I talked to you about Saussure um, and Saussure's key ideas. I've talked to you very quickly, I've introduced you very quickly, three consequences of Saussure. <coughs> Semiotics, more above particularly, uh, structuralism more generally, trying to cover the meanings of culture by uh, bits of culture, okay, and narratology, breaking down works, works of text, it's all work which uh, it's their constituent path to see how they work. And it's four minutes to ten, so that's all folks. See you next time.